So thank you very much for the introduction. And as uh, it was said, I'm going to describe on, on surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And Jeremy actually gave a very nice uh, talk this, this morning where he described how there are many new exciting topics in this field of surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. So what I actually want to do is um, in a summer school, so I want to give a bit more of a class describing a bit where this is coming from and comparing it with the description that we have done up to now. And, and this is goes in, in consonance with the work that we have been doing in San Sebastian. So uh, this is intended as, as a class. It has two consequences. The first one, I'm putting more equations that I have ever, ever put in a, in a talk, but they are all, I think all of them are simple, so hopefully it's not too difficult to follow. The second one, instead of repeating the same uh, journals all the time, I'm going to just put a short bibliography. So this book is possibly the big book on surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy that everyone follows. And then this paper is not so well known by the same group, but they actually like it a lot because it's the only one that I know that describes some of the FETs, or the first one that describes some of the FETs that I will discuss in this talk. Then this one is by our group, and this is the one that I'm going to follow more closely in, the, in this talk. And then these two ones I'm not going to follow so closely, but they are the two uh, first ones that describe this quantum picture of, of, of cells of surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, so I also wanted to put them there. So much of the work I'm going to present here is not ours, it's just general uh, background. But I will present some of our research. So this has been done in the group of Javier at Peru and San Sebastian, where I am. I should mention particularly uh, Mikolai Smith, who was the PhD student who did much of the work I will present. And this with a collaboration with Gesa, with the group of Jeremy Baumberg here in the audience, and with Alejandro. So let's first start by Raman, no search, just standard Raman. So in a standard Raman, we just have a photon, which is an optical visible frequency to electromole, for example, and interacts with a molecule. And this molecule has vibration, has oscillation of phonons. I will use this terminology uh, indistinctly. And then you can have an interchange of energy. So that your photon can give energy to the vibration, can excite the vibration. So you will have a photon at a smaller energy. You can see this with level states in which you consider you excite a state, and then you are going to decay to the first populated state of vibrations. Notice, however, that in all I'm going to discuss here, this is a virtual state. So I don't have any electronic resonant states in, in my talk. This is the stock signal when the photon gives energy to the photon. This is the most usual one in experiments. But you can have also the opposite one, where the molecule, the vibration of the molecule, gives energy to the photon. And this is called the anti stock signal. So I'm considering here a single photon where you have a, a, a single photon where then you are going to have a line at this frequency shifted by the vibration. Obviously, in a molecule, you have many, many different vibrations. So this is your typical. Raman spectroscopy, where you have many different lines, each of one indicates a vibration of the molecule. And as the vibrations are very characteristic of molecules, this can give you a lot of information about the molecules and also even what is going on with them in a reaction or how they can be modified. So how can we understand Raman from a very, very classical perspective? So the first thing, uh, just uh, elastic scattering. So in elastic scattering, we have a molecule, which we are going to describe normally by this Q, which is just a, a generalized coordinate that describes in general the position of all the, the atoms. And this molecule is going to be described like any other element by a polarizability. So then just by definition, we have that the uh, dipole moment is just proportional to the polarizability. As the polarizability is constant, then we just have that it's going to oscillate at the same frequency as the incoming laser, which is just, of course, straightforward because I'm in the case of elastic response. So that's pretty much by definition. Now, if we have Raman, the key in Raman is that this, uh, the position of the atoms can move. And as the position of the atoms move along this, this generalized coordinate, then the polarizability of the molecule is going to change. And there are going to be small movements, so we can do that to first uh, degree. And then when we consider that this displacement, in the case we are interested, is a vibration. It's just an oscillation. So it has an oscillatory uh, uh, form so that we just can write it directly. And this just last uh, expression we are just using the normal terminology where this derivative is usually is what is called the, the Raman tensor in a simplified picture. Now, in Raman, normally we don't care about this static polarizability, and what we care is about this variation due to the oscillations. And once we have that, we can proceed exactly the same as with elastic scattering, because we just have that the polarizability is proportional to the electric field, but now we have two cost terms, one coming from the vibration and one coming from the light. And if we just use standard trigonometry, we are going to have two different lines, one at the minus and one at the plus, so we have the Stokes line and anti Stokes line. This is the induced dipole moment, but if we want to see how much we emit, how much power, we just use your standard equation for emission of a dipole that you find in Jackson. And then we, you can calculate it. And normally, this is given as a cross section, which is just the ratio between the power and the intensity. 
So this already gives a very good idea of where these lines come from, but this is presents several problems. And the most biggest one possibly is that if you notice here, it predicts that the strength of the stocks and anti-stocks is the same. And as we will see later, this is not the case. And if any of you have done Raman, you will notice anti-stock is usually much, much weaker. So now we go for what is really the topic of the talk, which is search, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. So in search, we have a plasmon. I'm not going to introduce a plasmon because we have already got some several talks on this. But we have a plasmon. We put the molecule close to it. And we can have huge enhancement of the, of the, field, of, of the Raman signal. Because one of the main problems with Raman is that usually it's very, very weak. So you need a lot of molecules. But thanks to this enhancement, you can get much smaller amounts of, of, of uh, molecules. And when I say huge enhancement, I don't think it's really decided in the community still what exactly is the limit, but normally numbers that are 8 to 12 now, order of magnitude are the usual number that people mention. But I, I don't think there is a consensus on the exact maximum that one can get there. So when one talks of this enhancement, usually one discusses two different contributions. One is the chemical enhancement, which is, for example, if you are with a molecule next to a, uh, to a, to a metal, you can just have electronic changes, the, of the electronic densities can move, and then you change the property of the molecule. So you change its, its cross-section. But I'm not really going to discuss this, which I'm not an expert at all. The one I'm going to focus is in the electromagnetic enhancement, which, again, I'm biased here, but I think it's generally accepted that this is the main one. And if you have worked with CERS at all, or you have looked into it at all, you will know that CERS the enhancement due to search is equal to the fourth power of the electric field enhancement. So the, the field enhancement that you find in the presence of the molecule normalized by the, by the, by the incident field. If you know a bit more about search, you will know that this is not exact, and in the reality you have to take the square considering both the illumination frequency and the emission frequency, which are different. And this is, of course, very useful. Uh, so before uh, I'm going to um, expand on this and complicate a bit more these equations, I want to explain where this is come from, because my feeling is that not everyone actually knows where this comes from, and it's actually very simple. And to emphasize that it's very simple, I'm going to compare my standard case of Raman with a molecule in front of a plasmon, with just elastic scattering where the molecule is substituted by a small scatterer. In my case, it's just a small silicon sphere, it could be any other thing. Just to emphasize that this is not really anything specific to Raman. And this is discussed by this, this paper by Pablo. So if the first thing we have to consider is the excitation, and as I said, if we have a, a plasmon, we are going to have the fields are going to be enhanced by a factor that I'm going to just call with decay, which is just the field enhancement. And this, of course, this field enhancement is going to have a direct consequence in the direct moment, in the, in the direct moment of, of your molecule or of your small scatterer, which is going to be, again, enhanced by a factor of k. Notice that I'm always going to give normalized values just to avoid, for now, uh, the complication of putting parameters. Now, we are exciting a dipole. But we still have to consider how the dipole, dipole emits. And the dipole is influenced by the environment. This is all the story of the partial factor that, that we just heard. So if we want to see how it emits, the, the plasmon, the, by, by definition, the emission is given by the green function, how a dipole emits, which is going to vary if you put a molecule in vacuum. And now comes a bit of magic. And by something which is called reciprocity, the ratio of the green function is equal to the field enhancement. And the idea here is just looking at the reciprocity of, of, of general optics. So you want to see how the connection between this point and this point is the same thing as the connection between this point and this point. If you come from a, a more classical background, it's the same thing that happens with antennas. With uh, any antenna, they emit in the same way that they receive. And this is all reciprocity. Reciprocity is a rigorous uh, uh, statement, but it does come with a few, uh, com I mean, a few approximation, not approximation, but things you have to uh, verify. That's to say that normally it's very useful for Raman, but be a bit careful, because if you are looking to very, very specific search system, you may find situations where this reciprocity breaks. But ge generally, it's valid. And, I mean, reciprocity doesn't break. You are just in the limit where it doesn't apply. But generally, it's quite useful. The other thing I want to emphasize here is that you notice I'm not making difference between Raman and elastic scattering, because the only difference to this kind of formalism is that Raman scattering emits at a different frequency as the incoming one. But that's the only difference. Otherwise, elastic scattering also goes with the fourth power of the electric field enhancement. This is the electric field emitted. Of course, in an experiment, normally you measure the power. Then you just have to take the square. This square of the green function is usually written in terms of decay rates, but just the same thing. And now you see how we have this product, so that we have two mechanisms of enhancement. Once we are enhancing 
the dipole moment that we are exciting, which is the enhancement at the input frequency, and we are enhancing the emission, which by this reciprocity we can also directly link with the field enhancement. And that's when we consider that those are very similar, that's when we consider the fourth power. Let me also see that this very similar to get the fourth power, this is good if you are trying to do like an order of magnitude fan experiments. Then it's normally enough in, in plasmonics because plasmons are quite broad. However, if what you are trying to do is compare different Raman lines, or you are trying to compare two similar experiments, then you possibly need to look into this, because this can introduce uh, significant differences. Now, if, and to now I was talking of normalized, but of course if you just want to take a total emission, so in, in absolute numbers, you just have to take into account the value that you get, the cross sections, which gives you the value for a, for a, a molecule in vacuum, and multiply by this enhancement factor, and then you get what you want. And these factors can be, as I said, huge. Can be if you have an enhancement of 100, which I think that's very realistic, then you have eight orders of magnitude. And that's what was behind one of the first big successes on on, on, on plasmonics, which was when they were able to measure Raman signal from single molecules. Now we have pushed this even further. So this is working done in the group of Sen Saodong, collaboration with Javier, where they actually measure Raman with some molecular resolution. So what you are seeing here, they are using a, a tip, an STM tip, and you see that depending on where you put it, the tip at different position of the molecule, you, they can measure the local Raman emitted by this position. Which is not all impressive in the sense that completely breaks the diffraction limit, but it also allows you to map the vibrational modes of the molecule. Now this, this description is very useful that I've given up to now, but it has some problems. And one of them I've been focusing on the photons. But the phonons, the vibrations, are also important. And this can be more clear in the case of the antistocks. So the antistocks, if you remember, is where the phonon gives energy to the photon. So that means if you don't have phonons, if you don't have vibration of the, in the molecule, it's impossible to have antistocks, an antistock process. So that, uh, more mathematically, what it means is that you have to introduce that to this equation I was describing, the antistocks photon is also proportional to the vibrational population of the, of the molecule. Now, if you look in the stage stocks, this is less critical because, of course, you, it's toxic when you give energy to the molecule, that, so that can happen even if the molecule is, is not excited. But you start, start, or still have to introduce this extra factor. And this extra factor can be seen as a bit, this one is what gives you the spontaneous part of the stock process, and this can be linked to the uh, stimulated stock process. So it's similar to what you get in, 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 in a laser. So this is normally much smaller than one in the cases we're interested, but at some moment you will say that this uh, become actually important. These expressions already solve one of the problems that, that I was saying, because you see that now the ratio between these two is not longer one. So you are going to have a stronger strong that antistocks. And notice that you have different ratio, even if the proportionality constant is the same. So the difference between stocks and antistocks only come from this different effect, how the phonon populations enter into the equations. Now, we have an extra term in our own equation, so we need an extra equation, giving, giving us the vibrational population, but this can also be understood easily. So first we have the thermal population, we just have an harmonic oscillator at a given temperature, it's going to have a population. And then we have to consider the pumping. So each time, as you see, this term is very similar to this one, because by definition of stocks, it's, what, it's time that you have a stock process, you are populating, uh, you are populating your vibrations. This is a rate, so if you want to take an stat, uh, the, the quasi-static uh, steady, state, steady state, you need to divide by the decay rate. And then there is term, which I'm not going to discuss too much, but it's actually quite interesting, because it, it describes that you have to take into account, normally in Raman you, look in, you care about the photons that get to your detector, but here it tells you that for this kind of terms you have to care about all the photons that is in your, in your system. But I don't, it's rather technical, so I don't want to enter too much into that. And I'm going to just describe this, this same thing, the same uh, phono, uh, uh, phono population, vibrational population, in a different way using rate equation. So then you can describe it in a similar way. So this is very similar, just how much you increase. It depends on how much the thermal processes uh, populate your system. You have a decay, and then you have the pumping from the stocks photons. So this is very similar, but the advantage of this expression is first, you can look at the dynamics. But also, I think here it's more clear that there is something missing. Because you see, we are considering that the stock processes are populating the system. But the anti-stocks is going to depopulate. This is usually much weaker, but as we will see, we are getting to the kind of regimes where this becomes important and we really have to consider it. 
So these are the three final semi-classical equations where you see they are relatively straightforward equations. However, they are they all depend on each other, so they can give a nice rich behavior. However, this behavior I'm going to explain uh, when I describe the, the quantum description. So now I'm going to go uh, to the quantum description, in which is second quantization, so we have uh, typical Hamiltonian. Fortunately, we have already seen many of these, so they don't have to introduce too much. This is not, most of it is pretty standard. You just have the plasmon term, the molecule term, the, the oscillations. You have the excitation, which is done coherently via laser, which is exciting your plasmon. And as we have seen, plasmons are extremely lossy, so, so we have to include these losses into the system. And that you typically do it via the density matrix and using these Lindblad terms. And last, the really interesting term that I will describe in more detail is this coupling term, which is one, what I'm going to focus in the following. Why you have this? If you just can calculate all the dynamics of your system, for example, in Raman, you often want to see the actual Raman lines that you see in an experiment, and you can see do this with something which is called the quantum regression theorem. So let's focus on the coupling term, which is the really interesting one and where it comes from. So here I have a, a small derivation. I call it Raman derivation because it's inspired to all I have seen in this classical and semi-classical picture. So we get the typical interaction Hamiltonian. There is, for the expert here, an extra one half here, which technical point that took us very long to realize. So I don't want to discuss too much here because it's not too important for the main ideas. But if you want to get the sub value, then it's important. <coughs> And then we have to consider two parts. So this is the electric field. So this is the electric field of your plasmonic mode. And this you can quantize in a, the same way as you quantize any other cavity. So this is the critical parameter that we have already seen several times. It's the volume of your mode, which, of course, in plasmons can be very small. So this is the same kind of quantization you will do in any other cavity. There are two details. The first one is when you calculate this, actually you have to realize that the, in plasmons, or remember, Plasmon, the, elect the, elect the electric and the magnetic energy are not the same. Usually the magnetic is much less. So you have to be careful for this because if not, you can get an extra factor too, which in my opinion has confused a bit the, the literature. The other point is that there are much discussion now in the literature saying how this is not really true and then you have to use quasi normal modes and more complicated descriptions. It's true that this is not rigorous, but in my experience, if you select a nice system in which you have simple uh, Lorentzian like modes and, and which are sufficiently separated, then it's very efficiently and gives you a very good understanding and very good qualitative results, as far as you are careful which system you apply it to. Now we have the molecule, and then we have the same thing as I described before. Dipole moment is proportional to the polarizability. If you remember my classical description, I was discussing how this polarizability, the key is that I consider how it varies with the position of the atom, of, of the way to do it in a second quantization regime is just put it as a function of the operators of the vibrations. And this gives you the movement. And those are the same parameters as before. This is the Raman tensor that I discussed. And this is just the zero point uh, movement of, of, of this generalized coordinate. And once I have this, I have everything. Just have to put it together. Notice that the electric field enters twice, one here, one here. So that's why you have terms square here. And then we use the rotation with approximation. So we uh, neglect the terms in AA, A dagger, A dagger, because they rotate very fast. And we get our uh, Hamiltonian, interaction Hamiltonian. And if you are, have seen quantum optomechanics, so you remember the talk by, by uh, Jeremy, this is exactly the same Hamiltonian where, uh, the, the, of quantum optomechanics, where it gives us exactly the value of, 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 of G, which is make it particularly interesting because optomechanics uh, has, is known to have very, very large physics. Notice also that this is inversely proportional to the volume, so where, that, where plasmon becomes really interesting because, of course, the big advantage of plasmon is you can have very small volume. This is an analogy with, um, with, the quantum, with, with opt optomechanics. Besides, it's not only formally that the question is looks the same. You can actually understand it in a very similar way. And for that, I'm going to use a second derivation of the G factor, which is the one that actually the group of Kippenberg Kim uh, used in, the, in their original paper in which they really got inspiration not from Raman so much, but directly inspiration from the kind of thing people do in optomechanics. <laughs> so you consider your systems, which your original just considers if they were uncoupled, but then you take into account that basically your uh, plasmon is a dipole, your molecule is another dipole, which are strong, both of them are strongly detuned, so if you have two dipoles strongly detuned, the main effect is that you are going to have a shift of the frequencies. So what is important for us is that the plasmon frequency is going to be shifted by the presence of the phonon. So that we can read a bit more formally, in which you write, that's as I said, the, the um, frequency of the plasmon is proportional to the polarizability. And for all that I've been discussed, 
this polarizability depends on the position of the atoms, which is the typical uh, optomechanics you call the, the, the terms of the displacement, which gives you that the frequency is function of the displacement, and if you quantize, quantize in the usual way, you have a frequency that depends on the uh, vibronic operators, and you recover the same Hamiltonian as before. <coughs> Here I have gone a bit quick not to give too many equations, so I have not actually derived the form of G, but if you look at the original paper by, by uh, Kippenberg, you can find it and define exactly the same expression as we do, just the same value. So now we see that the, uh, we really have an automechanical system, so let me emphasize a bit this in a more pictorial view. So see, this is your standard optomechanical system in which you have, just look first here, this is just two mirrors, so you have your standard fabric pero uh, cavity in which it's going to be resonant at a frequency that is going to depend on the length of the cavity. If now you slightly change the position of the mirror, you are going to change the frequency of the cavity. So in the case of an oscillation, what you have is that this mirror, if you excite this oscillation, it's going to be vibrating harmonically, and as this oscillates, you are going to change dynamically the characteristics of the cavity. So you have a coupling between the, the optical and the uh, vibrational modes, where here the vibration is a macroscopic vibration of a mirror. In this case of the of, of SERS, what we have for this last description, as I said, is that we have the molecule that vibrates, and this mole vibration of the molecules introduce a shift on the cavity, which is what introduces this, this coupling between the two terms. So we can see them in the same picture, the big difference is the value of the parameters. So in plasmons we have the same problem as always, there is very big losses. You can sell this by saying that it's very fast, which is good for some things, but generally you would like to have smaller losses. But the main advantage of plasmons is that because of this very small volume, they can have extremely large uh, um, coupling strengths, and this is actually measured. And as far as I'm aware, there is much, much larger than any other optomechanical system. That that has been found. So when, with this I could just finish and say just open a book in quantum optomechanics and you will find all the physics, but this is not very didactic, so I want to uh, introduce some approximation that gives more insight in what this Hamiltonian mean. And this is the first approximation that you have to do, is just you consider a basically a, as a perturbation effect of optomechanics. I'm going to focus in the plasmon because you do it in both, but that's the most important. So basically you consider the plasmon state is the one that you find with no optomechanical coupling. So this alpha is the state that is given just by the laser illumination. As the laser is coherent, you can describe it just by a sim simple complex number. And then you have a small perturbation. And as this perturbation is small, once you put this into your Hamiltonians, we uh, are going to um, just neglect all the terms quadratic in this shape. And then in this case, we get a Hamiltonian, which is very similar to the Janis coming Hamiltonian without the rotation with approximation, where the constant term is, depends on this uh, population of the, of the plasma. And now once we have this kind of Hamiltonian, we can apply our standard Markovian approximation, quantum noise approach. I'm not going to describe this because that will take me just another lecture, but just to summarize, we can consider that this is a bath. Our plasma is basically a bath, which is, can be eliminated from the Hamiltonian, and then we, we get a very simple Hamiltonian only of the molecules, and the effect of the plasma is going to be both introduced a channel of losses, but at the same time you can pump, incoherently pump the, the system. So now we have a very simple Hamiltonian where you see that it depends on this uh, pumping and loss terms, which importantly for the following, they are proportionally to alpha squared, which means they will be proportionally to the intensity of the laser, and that's going to be important in the following. Once we have this Hamiltonian, this is uh, relatively straightforward to solve, we can get the dynamics of, of the phonon populations, and we can get the steady state, and if we are looking into emission, then you, we also have very intuitive senior, uh, uh, equations where the anti-stock is basically proportionally of how many photons you have in the system, how many vibrations, and how fast the decay as given by this new term. And if you are looking into the stokes, then basically it's given by the rate, because you don't need to have phonons, but again you have to take into account the possibility of this stimulated process. So let's see now how that this means in experiments. So these are the same equations as before, where I just have put the actual de de dependence of uh, uh, the new terms in intensity explicitly. And now we can de describe different regimes. So if we are in the thermal regime at very low powers, these terms is going to be very small, and then the uh, phonon population is going to be uh, dominated by the thermal phonon, which is why it's called thermal regime, of course. If this is 
thermal phonon, then those terms are constant. And then we find that the signal voltage stokes and anti-stokes are proportional to the intensity. And that is your standard situation. And that I want to make a point here because people sometimes get confused because as we say that the search is proportional to the fourth power of the enhancement, people think that this means it's proportional to the square of the intensity. But that's not true. In the standard case, if you just increase the laser of your power, everything is linear. Now, if we keep increasing the power, then we find a regime where these terms, this uh, pumping term, starts to predominate. So the phonon population becomes proportional to the intensity, and then immediately the anti-stocks become quadratic with intensity. And this is what is called the pumping regime. This has been discussed already many years ago in the context of this semi-classical description that I was giving before. But we can also see it in quantum auto mechanics. So this is the same paper that uh, Jeremy presented uh, today where you have our pico cavity and then we were able to measure <coughs> the anti-stokes measurement and you see this very nicely quadratic corresponding to the pumping regime which corresponds with these nicely linear phonon populations. And one of the advantages of using our, our new uh, framework is that now we, using this framework we could extract the value of the complex constant, uh, coupling constant and where that, that's where we get that it's possible to get these very, very large values of tens of milli electron volts. So this is for the pumping regime, but we can still keep increasing the power. And in this case, we are going to have that at some moment the phonon population, which is normally much smaller than one, is going to become much larger than one. And this time it's also going to, to become proportional to the intensity. And notice that this term, again, is because of the stimulated emission. So this last regime is due to the stimulated process, which makes we have that the, both the stocks and the stock process, we are going to have a quadratic dependence of the, of the emission. So here already we see how this is not as simple as we could have expected with several regimes. But interestingly, we are still, if you remember, in one approximation. We were still considering the case in which these two terms are the same, cancel exactly. This is not necessarily the case. So if you don't consider that, of course, you have still richer physics. And in particular, you have to consider that both of those are proportional to the intensity. So if they don't cancel exactly, you can make them as large as you want, in principle. Obviously, they are practical limitations. So now you can separate two cases. The first one is when this is positive. So if this is positive, you can get to the limit when you decrease the phonon population. And this is something which is extremely important in auto mechanics. It's all, all the story of, of cooling, because a standard mechanical oscillator has very, very large thermal populations, so you cannot see quantum effects. And to see quantum properties, they want to decrease the population. This is, however, for such maybe not that interesting, because our vibration may have 100 electron volts. So they may already be naturally very lowly populated. So because of that, we are gonna we have focus on the other regime, which which is when this is negative, and then we can make that the denominator goes to zero, and then we are gonna have a divergence. This divergence may remind you of lacing, although in the in the field it's technically called parametric instability. And actually, this is also related with what uh, Jeremy presented. So where they were able to measure that they, they find this supralinear dependence of the stock signal, not anti-stocks, the stock signal on the intensity. And using all this, we can interpret this as coming from this parametric instability. We don't quite get to the divergence because one of the effects of this strong pumping is that the phonon population grows very, very fast. So as sometimes you will have that just your molecule will change and you won't have your molecules anymore. So this is perhaps, or I could say perhaps one of the most clear um, indication that this par uh, auto mechanical descriptions can inspire new experiments. However, I'm using the, the word inspire on purpose because, and this is the big caveat I have to make here, is because if we actually compare the semi-classical and the quantum electronic description, you can see that they look very similar. This term, for example, looks very similar to this one. It looks very similar to this one. And actually, if you go carefully and you track how you write each one of those in those terms or the other way around, or if you do as Stefan Hughes did and he di expanded this description for a single mode to a more general description, you can see that these two are basically identical, almost. So the question, of course, is, OK, so okay, it's a new description. It's a new way of seeing that it's interesting for us. But is there not something new here? And this is a bit the outlook of what this field could go, I, I think, in the, in the next years. So first, the quantum approximation, the quantum equation I've shown, they were derived under some approximation. If you remember the Markovian approximation, little perturbative, 
they don't necessarily have to always apply. And in particular, the, the group of Stefan Hughes have just uh, published a paper in which they describe the case of uh, the canary, uh, so it's a, a hybrid uh, plasmonic uh, dielectric oscillator, and in this case, they, they get to what is called the strong optomechanical coupling, which all this doesn't apply, and then you really need to apply the quantum description to understand what's going on. In our first paper, we also describe correlations, because the quantum is very natural to that. Here, we just started doing that. So this is the second correlation uh, between the stocks and the stock photons, when you can get very large values. Of course, you can expand this to many other cases, and we are investigating into this, and it seems that you can get non-classical states, for example, which will require a quantum description. Then you can also get your molecule up to now. Basically, I have considered my just simple harmonic uh, oscillation. But if you have a quantized description, this can come very naturally into the description. I'm not saying this is impossible to do it classically, but it's possibly more naturally to just use your tidal Hamiltonian of your molecule and just plug it into your equation. And last, I have, we have established this link with the molecular optomechanics. So this can be interesting for, for optomechanics in general, because we can explore new regimes. But it's also quantum optomechanics is known to be a very rich field. So now all these things that people have doing, you can start thinking, can we measure this in Raman? And if we can, why or why not? So with this, I have really finished what I wanted to say. I just, this is just two very uh, quick flashes in case someone is interested, because I'm going to stay until the end of the week, so we can discuss it. One thing that we have also been looking how with Raman, it's also very important to consider with plasma that the fields can be extre extremely confined. And if the fields are extremely confined, then we can have basically what is called the, uh, the breaking of the, uh, of the selection rules. That is, we can excite vibration that normally we don't excite. And this can really give you a lot of information and give very new lines. The second one is up to, all I have described is the non-resonant case of SERS, in which the laser is resonant, is non-resonant with an electronic transition, but of course we can consider resonant SERS, which we have an electronic transition at the frequency of the laser. This complicates the, the Hamiltonian, but we are studying it. And to, actually, at, if you are in the weak illumination, you can at, understand it in very similar ways. You just have a more, con so I was saying that in non-resonant cells, the plasma act as a bath, as a reservoir. In this case, you have a more complex reservoir because it's the, it's the molecule coupled with an electronic transition, but otherwise you can understand it very similarly. If you keep increasing the power, then you have new effects because you have your dress state that can introduce coupling, a strong coupling even, between the electronic and vibrational states, and this gives you new physics. But as I said, I'm not going to give the details. If you're interested, just ask me. With this, instead of having a long list of conclusions, just going to give a single message, which is, if all you know of search is that it goes with the fourth power. That's very important, but b there is very much more than that, and there are phenomena that we are starting to explore, nonlinearities, cooling, possible uh, instabilities that I think can be very interesting for the future. And with this, if you have any questions, 